Of course, this is a solo show for George Widener called Tip of the Iceberg. And uh, we're really thrilled to have George here. This is our first show for George. And uh, I saw his, sh his work for the first time at the Outsider Art Fair in 2005. And I've been uh, taking with it ever <coughs> since, been collecting it myself. And uh, since then, he's gone on to world renown. His works have been shown all over, uh, including at the Hayward Gallery in London, the Hamburg Bahnhof in Berlin. Currently, there's work up at the Pompidou in Paris. His work is going to be shown at the Pompidou uh, later this year at the Picasso Museum because uh, Sophie Kao, the well known artist, is curating a show uh, of her own collection that includes George's work. And uh, we're just really excited to have him here. And of course, uh, Chris Wiley is a well known artist, writer, and curator who is uh, currently doing a lot of features for The New Yorker on photography and uh, was the chief catalog writer for the Venice Biennale, the 55th Biennale, and uh, has helped curate shows in, in the New Museum and, and biennials and so forth, and uh, we're really uh, happy to have him here. So I'm uh, turning it over to Chris and George. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, and also, again, thanks everybody for coming out on this uh, not so not so beautiful day. Um, George and I we had a we had a chance to talk yesterday, um, and so uh, hopefully we can rerun that conversation today. It was such an amazing conversation. You, you could just play the tape. Yeah, we could. I actually have it on my phone here, so I if anybody just wants to bear with me, um, that'd be great. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess like. It seems like the best place to start would be to start, you know, at the beginning, which is sort of how did you, how did you get started, not just making art, but like discovering your proclivity for dates? I've, I've done dates and numbers all my life. Uh, uh, I'm originally from the South, I'm not from New York. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, uh, but uh, there was in my uh, family history a few people that um, uh, had a little bit of disability, but they had some skills. And in my case, I uh, didn't have so much disability, but I had some of the skills, and I just counted as a child. Uh, it calmed me down and relaxed me. Yeah. And it started. And you would, you would write dates down I'd, in I notebooks? Did. I did. Yeah. Uh, as a child in school, I would uh, have this thing with writing down certain number patterns and dates. And this was kind of, a, you know, it was both a calming and a kind of meditative process for you, right? Uh, yeah, I didn't see it that way at that time. I was right. just doing it. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Kind of things take time to, you know, consider the process. Yeah. And so you served also, you served in the military. When I was a young man, uh, at 18, yes, on my 18th birthday, I wanted to get out of Kentucky. And yeah. So a way for, for me to go travel the world was uh, I went and joined the Air Force. Everybody in my family had been in the Army and, and the infantry, so I defied everybody and I, I went and joined the Air Force. Uh -huh. I was very young. And, Went overseas and uh, had a bit of experience and stuff. And uh, yeah, in, in Grenada, correct? I was in the Grenada combat support during the Grenada invasion, in 1983. I experienced um, a car bombing by the Red Army faction in 1981. I was 19 years old, and I was on some uh, in the East-West intelligence exchange. Uh, where we gathered information, uh, photographic information on the uh, Soviet bloc. Yeah, you had, you had. You were saying you had above top secret clearance. I did. I did at one time. It was a long time ago, like 40, 40 some years ago. So, <laughs> can you tell okay. us something secret? <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Time ago, but uh, I was a young guy. 
you know, I was a listed guy, and uh, yeah, I wanted to get out and travel and explore, you know, and, and uh, see the world a little bit. So that's what I did. You know? and, uh, yeah. yeah, you were doing uh, photographic analysis. In I, your was. Intelligence I was. And I was. I asked yesterday if you'd seen a UFO, and unfortunately no. he had not. Um, One of the things we did was uh, during the uh, Solidarity Movement in Poland, what was it? Uh, fall of 81, 82, my unit was activated and we uh, passed along photographic intelligence about the Soviets to the uh, Lech Walesa group mm. to allow them to continue their strike or give them confidence to, to continue their strike. That's a, a, a little known, wow. it's just military history now. Yeah. You know, people, you know, right, not top secret anymore. Uh, back then, it was an important thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah a long time ago. So, um, you know, I don't know how much you want to talk about when you got when you got back from the service. You had a, a hit a bit of a rough patch. Well, yeah, I got out of the service in 1984, and I I, I was going to be an engineering. Uh, I had an idea of being an engineer and stuff, and. Uh, so I went to engineering school. I was doing okay as far as academics, but I um, I just began to get a bit obsessed with the, the dates, and uh, I was beginning to have a little bit, I think, adjustment to disorder yeah. and stuff because I was I had been young when uh, a lot of there was like uh, twenty casualties during the, uh, the the bombing that happened in Germany. There. I was on site and stuff, and so I was still young, and I was just processing it, you know, and everything. And so I, uh, yeah, during that time, I started to, uh, you know, trying to be an engineering student, but I just uh, got into my, um, my 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 drawings and stuff. And at that time, I was just uh, like listing the dates in order to sort of calm myself. And, yeah. And everything. So there was a significant experience that you had around that time that seems to be like sort of, uh, there was like a transformative experience that you had. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, in 1986, uh, I had a bit of a, all this stress sort of came together. During the service, I did very well. But yeah, when I got out, I kind of had a, a, a post-stress uh, disorder a little bit. I had a bit of a breakdown in 1986. I was in the hospital for like a depression, and at that time they called it depression, stress, right. yeah. and, and stuff. And uh, so I kind of found refuge, so to speak, in my, you know, the, the dates after that period. But yeah. uh, while I was in the hospital, you know, I, I was, they they gave me drugs and stuff. And So I, 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 I was having um, some pretty strong visions and stuff at that time. And everything. Yeah. It was a long time ago. <laughs> well, the one, the one vision that you told me about yesterday that I found like incredibly fascinating as it relates to your um, sort of interest in dates was the, uh, the vision of, of time that you had. Can you, can you describe that a little bit? Well, it's, it's pretty personal. I mean, um, you don't have to. Certainly. No, I, I know. But I can describe it a little bit. Um, I was, I was, I remember being under a lot of stress because going into the hospital, it was something that was so different for me. Of course. I never saw myself as that way, but I was, I was having difficulties and stuff and everything, and I didn't know why at that time. I um, I remember I, at one point they had me actually strapped down on the bed, and I, I I had this vision of like dates and time as sort of a a physical embodiment and stuff of a, 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 like a cube or something like that in my head, and it was just like a, a flash, and I felt completely. I remember feeling very calm mm. at that time and stuff, and, and it was uh, 
was a, it was a moment that felt very calm in a time in my life when I was just struggling. And stuff, yeah. You know? Yeah, and I said yesterday, and I don't know if everybody is familiar with this, but I found it incredibly remarkable that that vision that you had, it tracks directly with a sort of like very advanced uh, physics notion of the way that time actually is structured, which is called the block universe, where in fact time and space exist as a single object, very much like perhaps the thing that you saw. Well, now here's the thing about what I do with dates, you know, as I was telling you yesterday. Yeah. The doctors believe that everybody has calculation, like, uh, what do you call it, effortless calculation, subconscious calculation inside of you, but you normally can't access that. Right. I can access it because of my family history. There's some autism and stuff in my family. And so, you know, the, that's what the doctors tell me. Sure. Stuff. So, but it's interesting, you know, that uh, what you're talking about, because uh, often, you know, scientists and mathematicians, they discover things by looking at something in a totally different and a new way. Yeah. You know, when you take two different things that are normally not related and you put them together, then you can sometimes find an intersection point and you come up with something new. Some of my works, I think that's what uh, you know that I, that I feel attracted to. I'm attracted to that. I'm attracted to the symmetry and the balance. But for me, I'm sort of going through these thousands of days, which it was a matter of uh, life circumstances and, and my you know just my predisposition to to do numbers and days. Yeah. You know that came about. And I was, I was really struck when you were talking about the way that you uh, intuit the, the patterns that you are, uh, that you're arriving at as something that you feel. Like you feel yeah. the patterns in the dates. Yeah. It's not something that you calculate exactly. It's, well, the feeling comes after you know, thousands of hours of uh, uh, having done it, but for me, it's like, meditation, you know, sort yeah. of, uh, it's a relaxing meditation. I sort of think of it as something like uh, what musicians do with music, you know. Uh, but really, I mean, uh, if you wanted to, you could like uh, see music as uh, different modulations of frequency, you know. You can make it mathematical and you can, you know, this and this, you know, put this together, balance this out and all this sort of stuff. But, but musicians, they feel. They don't do that. I mean, you know, they, 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 they got this structure uh, background of, of notes. I'm not a musical person, but I mean, they, they like, you know, they have a structure and a, and a method and a system, but they, they, they come up with a creative thing by often intuition and feeling, don't they? Yeah, that's, of course. That's what I say. Yeah. And so in terms of uh, in terms of feeling, and uh, I, you know, just the works that are in this room right here, um, I was struck by the fact that some of the dates that seem very significant to you are dates of you know, disaster, like the Titanic, for example, mm -hmm. um, and then there's the piece back there that is a collection of natural disasters. Can you talk about that? Is that something that's kind of... Well, in a way, it's... it's uh... It was me addressing something from a distance, maybe, you know, in my personal life. Uh, with all, with, combined with simply uh, historical interest and also a touch of humor. Uh -huh. You know, dark humor. <laughs> Sometimes soldiers have, you know, a, a, a dark, uh, because, you know, uh, if you're around a, you know, a, uh, uh, around war battles and such, uh, soldiers often joke and 
because to relieve the stress, you know, yeah. because if you're talking about the reality, the reality is so, uh, you know, uh, strong and difficult that you don't want to talk about that, but you, you know, you, you've got to um, uh, uh, find relief in the, uh, sometimes the absurd or the, you know, the, that's what, so it's, uh, it, it's a little bit of that, you know, it's yeah. a bit of dark humor and, um, yeah, because there is, there was somebody uh, who shared your name who was on the Titanic. Right? Yes, yeah. well that's, I'm, I'm interested in the Titanic for different reasons, but uh, as a teenager, uh, I happened to be looking at a passenger list of the Titanic, and it's on my name, <laughs> George Widener. And so, who was a, a, uh, the Wagners of Philadelphia, I do not know for sure if I'm related to them. Uh, but my father did have some distant, my father died when I was young, but uh, my father did have some distant connection to Philadelphia. So it's a nice, maybe fantasy for me or something, you know. It's, you know, this, uh, uh, I like the, the thought of it, you know. Yeah, George Wagner, who lent his name to the, the library of Harvard, I think. Also, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they did. They were like a famous New England family. Uh, my mother's family were, were, you know, poor country people, mm -hmm. and so I grew up, uh, you know, like a, in a different world. But it was a, it was a nice, um, you know, it, it, it was a nice thought, you know, yeah. this, this, uh, you know, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, people have all kinds of people in their families, you know. I mean, there's, you know. And you never, yeah, you never you know. You don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I liked it. I liked the thought, you know. And looking at some other sort of thematics, just of pieces that are in this room, you know, I noticed that there's a lot of uh, like poker chip motifs that show up in your work. And I know that for for a second you were interested in poker or well, in blackjack. Well, I uh, in the '90s, in the '90s, uh, in the '80s and '90s, I worked uh, like odd jobs and stuff and everything. I was traveling and I, I did a lot of different jobs. One of the things I did was I, I had a stint as sort of a, a blackjack player uh -huh. in Las Vegas and I was using my, uh, you know, counting ability and such. Uh, and I was, uh, so I, I love the colors of slot machines and I love the colors of the pinball machines. That's where I got a lot of my colors from and stuff. And um, because I have a strong memory I uh, lived partly in Kentucky and partly in inner city Cincinnati mm -hmm. in Ohio, which was across the river. But I, um, I have a strong memory as a child in the bars of Cincinnati, these beautiful pinball machines from the 60s and 70s, which now everybody's collecting. And they're considered collectibles and they've got beautiful colors and designs and such. And, uh, it was a very nice uh, memory for me. And stuff, and so I, I use some of that in my, in my. Uh, it comes out, you know. Yeah, yeah, it comes of out because it's in my head and stuff. So describe mm -hmm. the moment that you made the shift from sort of like writing and collecting dates to making like to making drawings. When did that happen? Well, yeah, there were two different things in the beginning because I had always drawn. I had, was able to draw from memory, but. I didn't know what it meant or anything. I, it was just a thing that I did. Uh, it relaxed me, and then I did dates, and they relaxed me. And in the 80s, I was doing lots of dates, and I got what you might say obsessed with dates. Mm. And so I was just putting them into notebooks back then, listing out the, the dates in the notebooks. And at some point in the 90s, I, 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 I combined them a little bit, yeah. you know, I started to combine them a little bit, you know, and, and such. And it was the period from, like, I say, you know, like, if you talk about, like, the outsider or whatever like that, I say from 1986 to about 1995, you know, I, I might have fit, because I didn't see right. it. What I was doing was like a science experiment. <laughs> right, it wasn't necessarily art, for me, right? you know, yeah. it wasn't like you know I was doing pictures. I was doing like this. I I, th I still thought myself as going to be an engineer, and I was I got fascinated in this 
And then I, you know, I started finding symmetry and dates. I started at like the beginning of a century and I just started listing all the thousands and thousands of dates. And I started to, to find patterns and such. And yeah. for me, you know, if you're like walking on the beach and you're looking for a particular shiny rock or something that catches your eye, a certain pattern, that's what I was doing basically. But I was doing it for myself and back then I was in particular circumstances and it became like, you know, my little secret kind of thing that I was doing just for my, I, I didn't want, you know, people would be like, what are you doing? You know, what is this, you know, and stuff. Well, one of the most fascinating things that, you know, we got to talking about yesterday was like, you know, obviously we, we are the audience for your art right now, but you have a kind of more potentially ideal audience for your art in the future. At what? You have a, a potentially more ideal audience for your art in the future, where you talked about uh, your idea that uh, eventually uh, these works will, will be like entertainment for a machine super intelligence. Well, I like to think that because, like I was, like I was telling you, like dates, of course, they talk about events that happened on a particular date. But okay, if you're a, uh, like an intelligent machine, if it's artificial intelligence, then you're talking about a massive, massive memory capacity. Yeah. And you're not able to pull up just one event for one date. You're able to pull up thousands or even millions. And so the patterns that I do, you know, the stuff I do, it multiplies exponentially, yeah. potentially, you know, with uh, if machines were to scan my works and because I put in different patterns of dates in my work and I, I, I play with it in this way, it's, it's a, you know, it's been recreation for me and it's been something that I explore, but yeah, I like that idea, you know? Yeah, I mean, it seems as if like the patterns that you intuit are a thing that could be potentially drawn out in, it, in their fullness by some kind of machine intelligence. In some of my works, yeah. yes, in some yeah. of my, my works. Like where there's a big field of it dates, of, yeah. of, of random dates, they would, they will find certain patterns in my works that I would, uh, have not considered, not able to consider. And also the magic squares, like what I was talking about, two different things. Uh, magic square is normally considered just a grid of integers. Yeah. Uh, like four by four, where they all add up to an identical sum, uh, horizontally, vertically, and diagonally. But I took dates and I combined them into magic into a magic time square. Yeah. So it becomes like an engine at that point, where I'm able to, you know, put in different themes. And I know this is like, you know, like when you see my works, some people. You're like, oh, this is like math or calculation. But for me, it's um, it's more like a meditative and a, and a like a, it's got a human aspect as well. I'd yeah. like to say that, you know, because, you know, yes, I, I'm a, you know, a, a, a numbers guy in some ways and a, a calendar, a ca lightning calculator and stuff. But um, for me, it was my way, and I think uh, that's what a lot of artists do. You know, it's processing the inner, this inner information yeah. and stuff, you know, that I've got. And it's, it's what I'm able to work with that I've got internally, you know, that I'm able to, to pull out and stuff. And it's, you know, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but, you know, I like it. I think know, it's I probably it. everybody's cup of tea in this room, I would guess. Yeah. I mean, um, but also, yeah, I found yeah. it, I mean, you know, when we were talking about this very thing, you know, the, the, the thing that came to mind for me is like, I know that earlier in this conversation tonight, you said, you know, I'm not a musician, 
but when you, you were talking about like laying out patterns of dates and like some theoretical super intelligence in the future being able to find patterns within the thousands of events that happened in those days, I thought like, my God, you are like playing a symphony of history. A little bit, yeah, you could definitely see it that way. I mean, uh, you know, like I was telling you about like the Titanic, uh, people have asked me, why do you put these future dates right. about the Titanic? And uh, what I was considering was the all the lives that were lost, the 1,523 plus lives on the, I say plus because there might have been a few stowaways mm. that they didn't know about. But uh, the lives that were lost, all of the uh, future dates that were lost when they perished suddenly, yeah. you know, unexpectedly, uh, you know, and, and that applies to, uh, you know, different things and stuff, of course. So I was, with the Titanic, I was simply putting the, the dates and, and considering that, you know, the future, as well as the Titanic. The, the Titanic sank, you know, when it was brand new on its maiden voyage. If it had not struck the iceberg, it would have lasted until about the 1940s, mm. and it wouldn't be famous today. Right. You know? <laughs> we wouldn't know about the Titanic, because it's like the, uh, you know, how many people are familiar with the uh, Olympi Olympia, you know, the Olympic. Right. It was the twin sister of yeah. the Titanic, you know, so it's, people aren't interested in that, they're interested more in the Titanic because it's a, you know, it's a drama, it's about people's lives, it's yeah. about uh, loss of life, it's about, we can all relate to these things, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so that's, you know, why the Titanic will live on, you know, in that way. Yeah. Well, and in terms of, you know, futures or potentially lost futures, um, this idea of time as an object rather than as a sort of like series of events, if you view time as an object, both past and future are just different points on a graph, essentially. Well, I'm, you know, what you're talking about, it ties back into my early period, and I was different back then. I mean, I was really, I was obsessed with dates and stuff in the, in the 80s. And I went through this period, I, got, I was much less social and mm. wasn't talking much to people and stuff and just, you know, getting by and stuff. But, but I was really into this and um, I felt like I was chasing that, some of those, those, those things, those, yeah. those images that I had and stuff. Mm. And I, I felt like I was chasing, I felt like I had, had this insight or something to this, you know, this, this cool thing that I experienced. Yeah. That's what I was trying to, you know, I was trying to capture that somebody. You know, I had the flash moment and then I was trying to, I spent years, you know, with the method, writing out all the different, uh, you know, methods and such and patterns yeah. and stuff. And that's what I did, you know, but. Uh, yeah, we were talking also about, um, you know, other, other people who've had sort of similar abilities in history. And, uh, and I brought up the, the mathematician Ramanujan. Um, and you were also talking about, I'm forgetting his name now, but another uh, guy who, you, who, had like who has incredible recall, you called him like a human Google. You mean uh, Kim P? Yes, yeah. Well, yes. yeah. Uh, in the 90s, I was diagnosed as a, a, a very high functioning uh, type of savant. They studied me uh, uh, in psychology papers mm. and did scans of my brain. I found I'm just slightly some different uh, pro uh, processing. But Kim Peek, uh, who was the model for the movie The Rain Man, was like the most spectacular example of a savant. And he was severely disabled, mm. which is typical of savants, most savants are severe, like 90% hmm. are severely disabled, juxtaposed to a uh, amazing uh, talent. Yeah. And, and so uh, I met Kim, I knew Kim, we talked like once a month and stuff, and it was very uh, amazing to me. Yeah, because it was like there was a way that you guys could relate. 
Yeah, yeah, I felt like a big brother to him in a way. You know, Interesting. He, he was like a uh, like a ten year old boy, hmm. you know, in his in his uh, and stuff. But he was a, a beautiful person. Yeah. yeah. I also, you know, I, I I I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up. It's also thematically in the in the works here. But um, I notice you have the Ukrainian flag on your jacket here. Yes, I'm and showing my support for Ukraine. I, but you're not just showing your support. I, I, uh, yeah, uh, I uh, last year I was watching the news and, and about Ukraine, and it it bothered me on several different levels. And I thought about it, and I knew I had the life experience to help out, and so. Um, I first went over there. Uh, I got. I had to get in shape. I had to lose weight and stuff, and get in shape yeah. and stuff. Uh, so I lost some weight and, and got motivated and stuff. And I wasn't sure whether I was going to fight or whether you know what el what uh, what else because they were taking on the territorial uh, defenses at that yeah. time. But um, uh, I eventually wound up with a group in Krakow, Poland, mm -hmm. which is mostly Poles and a few Brits, a few Americans, one Japanese lady that speaks fluent Polish, huh. which is pretty unusual. Um, and we run humanitarian aid. I've been three times into Ukraine. Yeah, and you're uh, about to go different back. Different areas. I'm going yeah. back, uh, and if anybody wants to know about that more and, and help Ukraine, you can, my group is totally vetted and uh, supported by Ukraine, uh, we've been welcomed by the the mayor of Kiev, Mayor Klitschko, and different mayors. We're known, and one of our guys has diplomat status, so we go through the border real quick. Yeah. So I mean, um, uh, we run supplies and help with logistics. Logistics is very important. Yeah. And and uh, and uh, yeah. So I've been over there in different areas and such. Well, I mean, I think I probably speak for everybody uh, when I say thank you for your service in that well, regard. I, I did it because, yeah, it, 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 it bothered me. When I started seeing about the, the Russian army went into houses and, yeah, uh, yeah raped, uh, tortured, murdered civilians, it, it said, I said, okay, I'm going to get involved in this, you know. So... Uh, and maybe I'm a little old to fight, but I'd have to get some weapons training, but I decided uh, I'm going to do something about it, you know. But, but anyways, uh, yeah, my group, it's a, it's a matter of fact. It's not a, a you know, it's not a, a, being in the war zone, it's just, a, it brought back memories for me also of stepping back when I was young and stuff, you know. Yeah. In a certain way, I only saw a little bit of action when I was in the service, but but uh, it brought back memories of when I was in the service, and I mean, I was I was I was in exercises to fight the Soviets also right. as a young man, so I identified it with with it much more than you know, like the the Middle East stuff and all that. So that's yeah, sort of, that was the like past and the future marrying each other in a way that's probably much darker than. Well, it's just, no, I've, I'm really glad I went over there because um, the people, uh, the Ukrainian people are very strong and united and uh, their country has been invaded. And um, I saw, you know, scenes over there as uh, like uh, World War II yeah. or something. They have not been seen in Europe since World War II or World War I, you know, they're doing trench fighting and such, and uh, a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of that. So is that kind of now the, ma the main, I can see just right one right here, there's another one over there. Is that now the main focus of your, of your art practice as well? Well, I've, no, I mean, I've done a few works about it. I did some sketches on site over there, and, and we, um, well, we showed it in Paris. Uh, uh, dealer Arthur Borgness got it, and, um, a hundred percent of that went to Ukraine, the sketchbook and yeah. so we said our group was in uh, was one of the first groups in Itzium when they were liberated. People were I wasn't there with the group at that time, but uh, people were wandering around like in shell shocked and 
Uh, so we fed like 400 people. Wow. Uh, you know, using the fund helped. I helped uh, my funds and along with other. Mm -hmm. There's like 40 to 60 people in our group at a different time, and we uh, we've got like four vans. But there's lots of people in Europe that are helping uh, Ukraine and a lot of like grassroots efforts. You know, people mm -hmm. have just you know gone. There's people. Uh, uh, there's in the last year there was people that not qualified that were trying to join up with the military and all that sort of thing you know a bit adventurers but now it's been weeded out and it's like um, they're they're taking just uh, you know like military uh, experienced people and stuff for the for the ZSU the, the armed forces of Ukraine yeah. but but there's a, a broad variety of people like helping out in humanitarian aid and stuff you yeah. know. Well, I also we take do. food, medicine, generators uh, to different areas, including up on the front lines and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Well, I also do hope that you stay safe and uh, yeah, I'm care. not I'm not taking huge risk or anything, but but yeah, there's drones and landmines. You got to be careful. One of our vans got hit by a sniper. Nobody got hurt, and then uh, another of the Polish vans was. A girl, uh, the snipers fired on her and she lost her leg. They got her to the, the medics in time, a Polish girl, yeah. but a brave Polish girl. But, um, it, you know, it's, it's war and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Puts, puts art in perspective as well, kind of. Well, for me, it's been kind of, uh, I've done some pictures about it. And I did like a battle map because I'm attracted to maps. And, yeah. And stuff, and um, so it's a little bit of my uh, a way to process and have closure a little bit mm -hmm. on some of my past, maybe you know, because um, yeah, to feel positive that there's a world, you know, there's a lot of problems in the world, but uh, people can um, help and help each other and make a difference sometimes, you know, and it's a good thing, you know. Yeah, and you were saying, you know, obviously you're doing that physically in Ukraine, but also I think, I mean, you kind of feel that way about making art yeah. also, or being able to um, be creative. I'm proud to do that in Ukraine, and I, I know that, you know, it's like uh, maybe, you know, like uh, for art people, it's something, you know, really different or something. I don't know how people see that, but uh, uh, for me, uh, as an artist, I'm an artist, and I'm proud to be an artist. Yeah. I'm proud to have a creative life and not a destructive life. I don't know what a destructive life is. I've seen it out there on the streets and stuff, yeah. you know? And, um, uh, you know, I want to, I want to be an artist. I want to, I want to go on and explore different things. It's wonderful, yeah. you know, to, to make things and to have a, a sense of, like, uh, purpose and meaning in life and stuff. And people need that, you know, everybody needs that. And, People find it in different ways, you know. Uh, hopefully, you know, yeah. and people try to find it. Some, some people don't, you know. Some people have tragic lives and stuff. You know. And that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're 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 all glad you have a creative life, too. That feels that feels like a very good note to end on and to take some questions from everybody here. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you'd be okay with taking some questions, or uh, any, sure. if anyone has any. Andrew has one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm curious if George sort of came out of nowhere to the Arnold's attention, not going to art school and through the, the trajectory that we're so used to seeing in the art world, but now that you've been established artist and been seen in institutions and galleries in major cities, I'm curious to know how your view of being part of this commercial art world and, uh, and seeing a lot of different art, how is that, to what extent is that filtered into your own, uh, your own perspective of being an artist, maybe your creativity, have there been influences from art that you've seen since you've been okay. an art? Uh, first of all, Andrew, I mean, let me, let me summarize, like, my past a little bit. From 1986 up to 1995, I was a 
doing things strictly for myself. Now, in 1995, I was um, in a homeless shelter drawing, and I was put into a vocational rehabilitation program. Uh, they scooped me up and put me in that, tried to put me to work and stuff, you know. And as a result of that, I was at the University of Tennessee, and I did have a few art, uh, like drawing classes, but I was just doing my own thing, and I didn't think, again, much about it. But they, they picked out the, the, the stuff that I had to take and everything. So, you know, uh, that's why I say, you know, like this whole thing. I know what, like the, the you know, this thing about being the outsider and stuff. Uh, I know, I wasn't aware of what that meant. I didn't know what that word meant back then, you know, from 86 to 95, but, but you know, I did have a few drawing classes and stuff in the in late 90s, and, um, uh, but, you know, I, after that, I, I just kept doing my thing for myself, my, 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 my dates and stuff, and, and I was drawing and stuff, and, um, Boy, I mean, you know, the art world, I mean, today, I'm not an outsider, uh, but I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a, an insider either, I'm not, you know, I, I, I think it's like a, sort of like a, when I come up here, you know, I think it's, in, in some ways it's wonderful, but it's also seems like a, a certain, uh, like you know, like a culture or something like a it's a, its own scene and stuff and stuff. So um, I I don't know. I've got mixed feelings about it. I think it's kind of cool in a lot of ways, but it's something that I not not because um, I mean I'm open and everything. It's not because I lived on the streets or I'm a veteran and stuff like this. You know, it's just that. Um, I think it's like uh, lots of people have cool life experiences and stuff, and that I want to, uh, I like to see the, 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 the different life experiences and stuff, you know, when I, when I come up here in, in, in art and stuff like that, but I, I don't really know a lot about, uh, I'm becoming more and more relaxed about it though some, but it seemed like something really different to me at first, you know, and stuff, and it's, uh, so I just, you know, kind of did my own thing and stuff, but I'm not completely, uh, now, you know, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm aware of, of galleries and stuff. I'm in gallery, you know, we sell work sometimes, and I talk with dealers, I've met a few artists. I don't hang out in the art scene or not like that, but. You know, but uh, it's good. It's all good, you know? I mean, yeah. You know, I, I have a sort of related question, which is like, how, how were your drawings like discovered? Could, clearly you didn't take them to anybody. Yeah. Uh, in the 90s, as I was saying, I was, uh, there was a couple of, uh, I was taken to the National Institute of Health uh, and they did some brain scans there. Uh, and they did a, a, a psychology paper on me as a savant, mm. um, exploring that. And um, I was passing through uh, Asheville, North Carolina, uh -huh. on my way to Boston. There was a, a veteran's uh, home, a house up in Boston where I knew I could stay. And I was just passing through, I was drawing, I was doing my drawings and stuff. And a, a social worker in Asheville, North Carolina, happened to offer me a place to stay. So I said, okay, you know, so I, because I, I like to hike and stuff. And, and uh, uh, so uh, it was near the mountains and everything. And so I ended up staying in Asheville for a bit. And there was a, a social worker that knew Henry Boxer of London. Right. I, I didn't know him, but knew about him mm -hmm. and knew that he, um, uh, you know, uh, showed artists who were uh, like self-taught or doing something that was, you know, different and yeah. stuff. And so she got in touch with him and me and him got, uh, got together and stuff. And yeah, so he started showing me 
Uh, it was around 2000, in the early 2000s. And stuff. So it was sort of almost just complete happenstance that you ended up staying it, with this. It, it was, yeah, yeah, it was. But I, I had lots of things in notebooks in the 80s and 90s that were, I didn't keep, you know, because of different circumstances and mm -hmm. stuff. Some of that stuff I kept, I, I had been uh, passed on, but a lot of it was, uh, uh, you know, lost and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does any, anybody else have questions for what George? What did you work on napkins? Uh, just practicality, because I had access to napkins a few times, and I didn't have paper, so I just worked on whatever. I used to work on paper that I'd find anywhere, you know, and um, I liked that. And today, um, I stitched together papers. I, you know, put them together and everything. It was just sort of a, a nod to my past. You know, it's, it's what I did in the past. It feels comfortable to me instead of, I didn't know in the beginning that you could buy like a large sheet of paper. I thought, because I was using like notebook paper, you know, and it's like eight by 11. And so to build a, a bigger sheet of paper, I would just use a smaller papers and glue them together. Because I didn't know, you know, I wasn't going to art stores in the beginning, so I didn't know that you could like buy a, a big sheet of paper. <laughs> so I just used what I had and stuff, you know. And 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 a guy they used to give me napkins in the, you know, places and stuff if I asked for them extra napkins. So I'd always had a supply of drawing materials and stuff, and I liked the brown ones better than the, you know, the other surface. And so I started staining them a little bit to get the look that I liked and stuff, you know. Just what, practicality, what, really. What do you stain them with, tea or? I did, tea, tea coffee, yeah. you know. Yeah, I found that works and stuff, and yeah. I like, uh, I like old papers, I like aged papers. Uh, today, I, I collect like uh, old maps and, mm. and old books sometimes. I'm, I'm attracted to that and I love, I actually found uh, in London, they auctioned off some uh, 16th century paper. And I bought some old paper and I, you know, it's the, the thing of traveling in time, you know. If, uh, if I draw, now, you know, if I draw on 300 year old paper, you know, what does that mean? You know, I'm like, cause I'm, I'm working with these dates that are far in the past or far in the future. And you know, it makes you think about, uh, you know, it makes you think about these things. It makes you think about mortality too, you know? Mm. It's like, yeah. Have you made drawings on that paper yet? On what? On the 300 year old paper? Oh, uh, a little yet? bit, yeah, a little bit. But I love the idea, you know, like, um, because I'm, you know, science guy a little bit. Uh, I studied uh, on my own uh, conservatory mm. thing, you know, and stuff and, um, so I'm, 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 I know a little bit of the, the techniques of conservatory. So I had this, I had this, uh, you know, this fantasy of trying to draw something and people would find it in the future and my name's on it and they think it was done 300 years ago or something, you know, I love that idea. And like me and Henry Boxer, we're gonna do a gag because I can mimic things, you know, that I see and stuff and I was gonna, I was gonna draw an old master's uh, drawing on like 300 year old <laughs> paper and we were gonna put it, we were gonna hide it in the back of a, they have rare book collections. We were gonna put it in the, in the, hide it in the back and then have somebody go in there and open it up in front of the librarian it falls out. And, <laughs> oh, we found this lost master's. And then I was gonna show up like a week later, oh, that's mine, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, D but, don't tell them actually. Don't tell. Yeah, them. it was just a gag, but yeah. it's okay to do that as a joke. But if you, you know, you like, you you don't want to <laughs> be a forger or nothing like yeah. that. No, yeah, no. but you yeah, do I, also. I, I, I was love just that thinking idea. that you sometimes uh, put errors in your drawings, don't you? Like on purpose. I do for different reasons because I like the idea that of a human touch because uh, Kim, uh, Kim Peek, you know, I met Kim. Uh, 
how to say it's uh, Kim could do things that I could never dream to do. Um, uh, but uh, I'm able to to sit here and to talk with people and express, you know, uh, my creativity and to to um, to be creative. Kim wasn't able to. Kim was just like a like a computer and stuff, right. and so I do it uh, partly out of respect for 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 like Kim, and also like the idea in the future of somebody going through uh, thousands of my dates and they go, aha there's a that one's wrong you know and stuff and uh, uh, it's like a to let them catch it you know to yeah. let them catch it and stuff it's like a little little joke a little bit yeah, yeah it's like. Uh, you know, I think I like the idea. You know, like Alan Turing, mm -hmm. the uh, the mathematician uh, who's connected with the uh, Enigma machine, a yeah. uh, code breaker of World War II. I've done a few works uh, because I love the story of Alan Turing and and uh, the whole code breaking team and such and the, about the Enigma. And um, so I did a, a series where I was uh, putting in codes and secret references and, hmm. and it's going to require some, some dedicated effort to, um, to, to crack it and stuff. If you took, if I take calendar calculation and intertwine it with, with uh, you know, cryptography, it gets pretty, uh, it's like the Voynich Manuscript, you know. <laughs> the Voynich Manuscript, they don't know what it is, yeah. you know. It's, uh, I don't know if you've heard of that. Yeah, it's an alchemical manuscript, isn't it? Or, yeah, yeah. It's, it's references to uh, botany, but there's a, a language, they believe it's language because it has patterns of, of, of us in such a way that, uh, that, that languages normally have, and they've not been able to decipher it. Right, yeah. And so anyways, I love that. I love that story. I love that idea. And so, yeah, I put in, you know, because uh, I don't want people to like uh, think they got to bring a calculator or paper and pencil or try to figure something out. There should be elements of mystery. You mm -hmm. know, I, that's what I love is the, you don't have to see my works and to just see them as calculation. Hopefully people will see mystery and, and um, you know, yearning or exploring hmm. and them, you know. And, and yeah, that. and that's sort of what makes them art rather than just mathematics. Yep, uh, some mathematicians have seen some of my magic squares, which are called matrices in mathematics. And when I combine dates with magic squares, they consider it a hybrid. And I've had serious mathematicians, they say, I've never seen that before. So maybe I've got an idea in there for some serious mathematician as well, but mm. that's for mathematicians to figure out. Not, uh, I'm not a, a you know. Yeah, yeah no, that, was, that was where we also were talking about Ramanujan last night who uh, mm. had, he has, you know, uh, notebooks upon notebooks now in Cambridge uh, University Library uh, that people are still trying to figure out. Um, and he, uh, he would receive the answers, well, he said, he would receive the answers to mathematical formulas when the, the local goddess from his uh, area of Kerala, I think, um, would place the answers on his tongue. Yes. I mean, there's, a, there's an overlap between, you know, uh, uh, some uh, uh, between intuition, these 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 things that come to us in our subconsciousness, and then the the producing them in in reality. You mm. know that uh, uh, I often get some of my symmetrical patterns in my sleep. Uh, in my past, I played games with. License plates, converting them into dates, house numbers. I converted them into dates. I did it automatically. I don't do it so much nowadays. Um, but uh, yeah, it it's, was an automatic, you know, internally generated 
thing, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting for me uh, to hear the stories of some of the, the other, you know, like some of the classic outsider artists. It's mm -hmm. been very interesting for me because, uh, you know, it's, uh, I realize that they're doing something very different, but uh, they were in a certain circumstance, you know, like Henry Darger being mm -hmm. in his room and isolated. And yet he found this this way through this. I think his his love of Civil War history, and 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 trying to deal with his with his life uh, in a Catholic run uh, uh, hospital, you yeah. know, and and just trying to deal with life. It's it's amazing to me to because I didn't know about any of that stuff right. before. But I I find it you know very interesting the you know, even though he's doing something completely different, the, that there's a little bit of, uh, you know, um, connection and stuff in yeah, that way, of, you know. That, that I guess getting back then to, to Andrew's question, do you feel like you're, I don't know if you you'd necessarily take inspiration from other so-called outsider artists, but you, you feel a kinship, perhaps, with some. I, I, it's right that I have a, uh, that I am, uh, have a connection to the outsiders that I'm that I'm shown sometimes yeah. with outsiders. It's not to say that I'm an outsider today because I'm not, but yeah. I have linkage. Right. It's, it's and it's yeah, it's true. But I've evolved, you know, and that's what everybody does. But I've been fortunate in my life that I've been able to uh, interact with with the uh, the gallery system, for example. It's, yeah. It's helped me in my life and stuff, and in a lot of in ways that I think were positive. I mean, it seems like it. Yeah. yeah, I mean because, yeah, if I had been like where I was in the late '80s when nobody knew what I was doing, and then I was writing in my notebooks and creating patterns and stuff, maybe, and some of that stuff is out there. But if I had done that for all of my life and. And then they found it. Oh, he's a classic outsider and stuff. But for me, it's uh, I like it better the way it turned out. You know? <laughs> we like it. Better. Oh, got a know, I'll say it. You know, <laughs> I'll just say. It. I'm, yeah. I, yeah. I think we all like it better that way. Uh, yeah. You, you got a question right here. We have a drawing of yours of what looks like an airplane. Did you do that while you were in the military? Um, I did some drawings of uh, a little bit uh, when I was a, a young guy in the service. Uh, I, I, I saw, I, I witnessed an airplane crash at Mannheim in 1982. Well, it was a helicopter crash where 44 people died, and that was stuck in my head a little bit. But um, uh, I did not. I did not do that. The, which one is it? Oh, it's a, uh, I did some of the structure of that. It's a little bit, I played around with it some, but a lot of that stuff is no longer around. I just, it was, it was lost. Anybody? Go ahead. Uh, so um, I just want to say first off, thank you very much for um, sharing your story, um, especially being so personal um, with uh, mental distress, because I myself, I struggle with that. And so hearing you talk about it was very uh, impactful. Um, and so my question, having certain labels or experiences attached to your name, i.e. homelessness, mental distress, um, and how that can deter people from taking what you do seriously, what obstacles did you overcome and what advice would you give someone else? Um, I have found, uh, I found therapy, I guess you could call it, in my work. Um, it saved my life, really. I mean, I guess you could say, uh, uh, drawing and, and the dates, it's, it's saved my life. Uh, you know, my friends, uh, I know, I'm friends with a few uh, veterans, and I like my best friend, uh, Danny, he's a Vietnam War veteran. He was, I tell you, I mean, he, he was like 11 months out in the, the bush in Vietnam. He's just a country guy from South Carolina, and he, he, he struggled 
we got out of service and we're good friends. But you know what he says to me? He says, George, he said, that is so cool of what you do that you can, you've got this thing that you can, that you can do. And he says, I'm real proud of you, George, you know, that you go into a, a, a gallery and, and do your thing and stuff, you know. And, and so um, I just, um, you know, I, I feel like um, to try to be productive and to try to be positive and optimistic. Uh, I'm an optimist, you know, even though I do things about uh, destruction and, and disasters and stuff, you wouldn't think it. I'm not a dark, I, I, I don't want to be a dark person. I, I try to, I'm an optimist. I consider myself uh, an optimist and stuff. And, and uh, you know, you know, you talk about Ukraine, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm being an optimist, yeah. you know, and doing what I'm doing and uh, helping the, the civilians over there and stuff. I felt real good about it, and I got something out of that for myself, you know, that's really cool yeah. and stuff. So uh, I don't know if that answers. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Maybe just uh, a remark. I, I know you for many years now, and um, you have been traveling a lot. Uh, you are, I mean, every time I hear about you, you are abroad, you are elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, I, I was just curious the time uh, that you spend uh, in a kind of a nomadic life versus the time you spend to create in your studio. Well, and I was wondering, you know, how you keep, you know, so that you dream at night and you. You, your idea well, here's the thing. I haven't had a traditional studio. I mean, there's only been a, when I was in Asheville, they gave me a, like a little studio and stuff, and, and I, I was sleeping in it and stuff, but I like, I've not really had a traditional per se studio, but I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to get one. Um, but I've been doing my drawings. I did my drawings just anywhere, and so I'd get like a flat board and, and go on a walk, and then I'd sit and draw, and, or I'd uh, draw in parks. I'd even done the thing of drawing in cafes and stuff, you know, and that's, that's one of the reasons, like, um, that I, my works are often composed of multiple pieces of paper because I could fold them up, mm. you see, and keep them in a backpack, and I'm mobile. You know, it's very practical, you know, and it's like, uh, so I could work on just one section and, and, and wherever I'm at, you know, I can sit in a cafe or whatever and work on one little section, but if I folded the whole thing out, you know, you'd have a big picture. So <laughs> I like that, you know, it's... Um, when you're working on just one section of a work, can you keep the entire picture in your head while you're working on just one section? I, it's just intuitive. I just, yeah, I just, it just flows and I just do a section at a time and stuff. But I'm changing as an artist, you know. I'm, 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 I feel like I'm growing. I want to try to do some different things and I've, I've you know, I want to do some things and they're going to be different. You know, I've like had this idea of like painting uh, like with acrylics. And that's going to be something really good. I like this, like this thick paint. I've seen this, you know, and I like this. And it's going to be so different. And I can, I believe I can do it, you know. But, uh, I think you can too. It's going to be like a challenge, you know, like a project or something. But it's going to be so different from this place. And that's the wonder of being an artist because you, you grow, you know. And you get to, you know, try new things. This is like being, that's the, it's the thing of being a creative artist, you know, you get to, and maybe, you know, people, some people don't like it, or maybe it doesn't work in the, the gallery, but so, so what? Maybe give it some time or something, you know, but uh, I'm, that's what I'm, I'm, you know, trying to do. Yeah. Um, anyone else have a question for George? Great. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank, you, thank you so much, George. Thank you, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Uh, we're going to actually have an opening reception uh, from 6 to 8. Uh, so if you want to 
May Yahweh come back and have a drink with us and celebrate your more than welcome. Cool. That was thank great. You, thank you, Chris. That was great. Thank you. Good, thank, yeah, you. thank you. That was yeah. awesome. Yeah. We've, we've, done, we've done our work for the day. That's right. Yeah, that's might good. as well just relax. Yeah. Is it good? That was great. Did you great. like it? Yeah, it was cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.